In this video, I'll be explaining what to expect in an IEB practical exam. So in order to do that, please follow along by using this summary. Every practical exam is reasonably predictable because these are the eight skill areas and the same skill areas get assessed in every practical, obviously just by doing a different prac. So you'll always be expected to do these things. During an experiment or a practical investigation, you'll always be asked what is the specific aim or the purpose of the experiment. You'll also be asked to give a hypothesis or a prediction of what you think is going to happen, identify the variables involved in the practical, and then be able to write up a proper method with its apparatus. Now, doing any experiment, you're obviously going to get some results at the end, which you need to analyze. So this would include drawing tables and graphs. Once you've got your results, you're going to have to analyze it. You're going to conclude, so to see what did you actually figure out during the practical, interpret your results, and then also evaluate to decide whether your results can actually be relied upon. Are they valid? So the best thing in a design of an experiment would be actually to look at each of these components separately. So firstly, let's look at the aim. Now, The aim of an experiment is always the purpose of the experiment. Why am I doing this? And it's very important that you must remember the aim, if you get asked to, to write an aim, it's always a statement that starts with the word to. So it's to determine or to test, to find, to see, to count, to measure. Always must st start with the word to and usually figuring out what the aim is is going to be valued at like one or two marks. Now, once you've figured out what your aim is or what you are going to do, this is almost like asking a question. You're going to formulate the hypothesis. Now, hypothesis is you guessing what you think is going to happen. It's suggesting a possible answer to the aim of your experiment or a question that you've asked. So it must always be a statement, not a question. Uh, just think of it as a prediction. And remember, you need to be able to actually test it in a practical to see if it's true or not. Let's do an example. So let's say I give you an experiment and I say, you need to conduct an experiment to determine the effect of exercise on a person's heart rate. And then I say to you, okay, what's the aim? Now, the aim is the easiest thing. All you need to do is look at the instruction, like the sentence on the screen now, take your highlighter and find the word to. You put the highlighter down where you see two and you simply highlight till the end of the sentence. Good, that pretty much is your aim. So in this case, the aim is now underlined and it starts with two, to determine the effect of exercise on a person's heart rate. So from here, after I've got the aim, I can use the same statement to figure out both the variables and a hypothesis. So this is what you do next. So first of all, when you look at the underlined, which is your aim, find the keywords and circle them. The keywords here are exercise and heart rate. So exercise and heart rate, since these are your keys, keywords, these will also be your variables. Now to write a hypothesis, you need to take the word exercise and heart rate and make a sentence, but predict what the effect of the one on the other will be. So one possible hypothesis could be heart rate will increase with an increase in exercise. But since it's a prediction, you could also say heart rate will decrease the more a person exercises. As long as you say how the exercise influences the, the, the heart rate. So how the one will change in relation to the other. So when we think about heart rate and exercise as our two keywords, as I mentioned previously, these two keywords also happen to be our variables. Our variables are things that can change the outcome of an experiment. And we find three types of variables. We find the independent variable, the dependent variable, and then the fixed or controlled variable. So variables, as mentioned before, are all the things about the experiment that can be changed. So the fixed variables or the controlled variables are all the things that needs to be kept constant to ensure a fair test.
So the values here, you decide since you're the guy that's doing the experiment, but this is the information that you usually don't write on a table or a graph. Now the independent variable is the variable that is changed by you as the guy doing the experiment. Since the independent variable, the word starts with an I, I always use a capital I in thinking me as a person is in charge. In other words, I choose what to start the experiment with. This is the variable that I control um, from the beginning as the guy doing the experiment. The dependent variable is obviously a value that I'm going to be measuring throughout the investigation. So at the start, I, I don't know the values yet. That depends on what's going to happen during the experiment. So let's apply these three principles to our actual example about the heart rate and exercise. So remember the experiment to conduct an experiment to determine the effect of exercise on a person's heart rate. And then we circled the keywords. Our keywords were exercise and heart rate. So thinking about that, if I had to do an experiment to actually determine the effect of exercise on a person's heart rate, will I be selecting the heart rates at the start of the experiment? Or will I be selecting the type of exercise? Well, obviously the type of exercise. So since I'm choosing that at the beginning, the, the exercise is going to be my independent variable. So then while I'm doing the exercise, I will be collecting the information, the data on the change of heart rate, which means that depends on what happens during the experiment. So my dependent variable is going to be the change in heart rate. Now, when we've done our experiment and it's complete and we've got our data, we've collected all the changes in heart rate for this experiment, for example, we're going to be expected to write it up. We need to record it. So it's always going to be in a table and then in a graph. So when we draw a table, the independent variable always goes on the left-hand side and depending on what happens during the experiment, will go on the right-hand side. When drawing a table, make sure that you always have a heading. You use a ruler so you've got neatly ruled lines. Head your columns and your rows correctly filling in the data correctly and make sure that you've got no units in the body of the table. In other words, only in the headings, you'll say heart rate beats per minute, not in every little blocky down. So a table like this could be anything between five and six marks. Now, as soon as you've got your table done, you actually need to draw a graph as well. Now, when you draw a graph, obviously, you again, you need a heading. You need your axes labeled correctly plot it correctly, have a nice scale, and then use the correct graph. Now, when you label your axes, you're going to put your independent variable at the bottom on the X and then your dependent on the Y. So if this is your axes, I always remember that Y, ever I'm doing this experiment, goes on the Y axis on the left. In other words, why I'm doing the experiment is my dependent variable. It's a question. I don't know the outcome yet until I'm done with the whole, exper whole experiment. So that's my independent variable going on the y-axis. Then on the x-axis, I will actually put my independent variable. The thing that I already know from the start of the experiment. Because I'm the guy in control. So in the effective exercise example that we did, um, we would put type of exercise on the X at the bottom and then obviously the change in heart rate on the Y axis. Using the data from your table and your graph then, you're going to look back at your hypothesis, the prediction that you made before you did the experiment and then decide was your hypothesis correct or incorrect and then write your conclusion in which you say the hypothesis was correct or incorrect either way and then saying since the data shows that the one thing increased or decreased as the other thing increased or decreased. So let's say for example we have a graph showing how heart rate changed with the intensity in exercise. And then once we've drawn the graph, we see that the heart rate goes up as the intensity of exercise goes up. So then we look back at what did we say initially in our hypothesis? What did we predict initially? 
If our hypothesis initially was heart rate will increase with increasing intensity and in exercise, it means that our graph actually shows that our prediction was correct. So that leads us to the conclusion which will then say the hypothesis is correct since the data shows that heart rate increased with increasing intensity of exercise. So you have to have three parts to your conclusion. First of all, saying whether the hypothesis was true or not, and then saying what the two variables did according to your graph. As part of the IEB's practical exams, you'll be expected to both do an experiment that they give you and to design your own experiment. So there's a doing component and a designing component to every exam. When you're asked to design your own experiment and write your own method of how to do an experiment, it's important that you list all the equipment, in other words, the, the, the things, the chemicals that you're going to need for the experiment. You have to list that either as numbers or as bullets under a separate heading. You need to give a detailed step-by-step -step plan of how you're going to conduct your experiment. In other words, you tell me what you're going to use and how much of it you're going to use. You need to be careful so you describe it so well that someone else is able to repeat your experiment. However, the greatest amount of time in a practice exam is spent on doing an experiment according to a given method. So you'll be given a method or an experiment and some apparatus and then you have to actually conduct that experiment. You have to do that experiment following the instructions. Okay, the first thing to do when you receive your practical exam is that you're going to have 10 minutes reading time. So during that reading time, look at the list of apparatus that's supposed to be at your workstation. Go through it and make sure everything is there. One of the things that you'll see are various sized glass beakers and containers with chemicals in. Here we see two little glass beakers with a chemical in and um, just behind it we see two test tubes. They're standing upright during storage. However, when you use them, you're going to turn them right side up and put them through the holes so they stand nice and firm. Remember to make sure that the bottom stands um, clearly in the little hole. Now when that's ready, everything that you use needs to be marked. So you'll notice that the beakers are marked with an A or an A and a B so you don't get confused with what you are using. This instrument is called a thermometer, it's an electronic thermometer. So you're going to press the red button on the right hand side. You can see the temperature reading is 19.6, there it goes to 19.5 degrees. When you're done you switch it off. Okay. These little strips are called universal indicator strips and you can see on the side there's all sorts of colors on the container. The strips inside also have various colors on. Now you use this to uh, determine the pH of something. Now we know pH goes from 0 to 7 for acidic and 7 to 14 for base. So what you'll do is you'll take this little strip and here I've got some vinegar. If I stick it in immediately see how the color changes on the strip. I then shake the liquid off, put it on the side of the container and see where the color matches. Wherever the color matches, here we go, it matches 3, so the pH of vinegar is 3. Another apparatus that you get for measurement is a syringe and you'll use this often. You get different sizes, it's got a plunger at the back, this one goes all the way to 20 milliliters. Now what's important is when you suck up any chemical substance, you'll notice often that there's air bubbles in, like over here. You can see there's an air bubble caught there, which we don't want. To get rid of your air bubble, you'll turn your syringe right side up like this, nozzle pointing upward and then tap it on the side. Push out the air bubble by inserting or pushing up the nozzle a little bit or the plunger until you are sure that the air bubble is out. Then you turn it to the side making sure you've got enough juice in there. You keep repeating this tapping and pushing until all the air bubbles are out and you have just the right amount or the right volume of liquid that you wanted inside. So if you wanted only five or only six moles, you make sure that that's what you have at the end. Now you need to take note that throughout the paper you'll see one or two places where the instruction says call the teacher. 
That means you put up your hand and when the teacher reaches your working station, um, you'll be given marks for what you're actually doing. So your teacher will look at the syringe that there's no air bubbles. Um, I will look at the test tubes that you've measured correctly. So it's very, very important that you call the teacher. The last thing is that you'll be asked to evaluate the experiment. In other words, questions like how did you work carefully to ensure accurate results? Now, when you get asked something like this, you need to name what apparatus you used and how you used it. For example, you can say that you used a syringe to measure exactly 20 milliliters of vinegar or that you used a thermometer to make sure the water stayed at 60 degrees Celsius. You will also be asked possibly how can the design of the experiment be improved to give more accurate results. Now please don't say there the method was silly or we needed better equipment. You should find the weaknesses in the given method and then say how it can be improved. So throughout any practical exam, remember you get most of your marks for what you're doing. That's why you don't study for a prac exam because it's not about what you know and what you can remember. Good luck for your prac exam.